Welcome back. This is part two of chapter nine, where we are looking at therapies for chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, looking in particular at asthma in this segment. So another drug that we can use to uh, for airway purposes are the anticholinergics, the muscarinic antagonists. What we would say these are parasympathetolytic drugs that we use for things like motion sickness and, par and, and, and Parkinson's and so forth. But that can also include the dilation and relaxation of airway smooth muscle. So these competitors with acetylcholine going after the M2 receptor like atropine will dry out someone's lungs. Uh, in fact, uh, when we talk about atropine, one of the one of the signs of atropine overdose, dry as a bone, and that's not only true on the outside of the body, but also in true in the airways, and that's why atropine can work in situations of asthma, crisis, and so forth. Our drug example for this category of anticholinergics. Uh, is iprotropium, and there's a close cousin called teotropium. Uh, has a slightly longer onset of action um, and, and is a longer acting uh, bronchospasm uh, treatment. Um, both of these drugs, what they're doing is they're competing for that M2 muscarinic receptor, uh, you know, anti and anticholinergic by blocking uh, the function of uh, acetylcholine here. I have atropine in here, but the atropine is not playing a role. What it's doing is going after those M2 receptors. The issue with iprotropium and teotropium is that they're charged enough that they do not circulate well through the body. And that can be a bad thing. You can't take it orally for these things. On the other hand, it can be a good thing because you're not going to get a whole lot of, or you shouldn't get a whole lot of side effects from these drugs by delivering them inhalationally. That's how we use uh, delivery to overcome technical issues sometimes. And that's what makes the lungs sometimes very con relatively convenient for, for drug delivery. However, the thing is, is that you will elicit potentially sympathetic side effects. And even though these drugs are somewhat charged, if they make it into the bloodstream and they circulate around, they can cause sympathetic uh, side effects. So dry, sore, dry mouth, okay, anti-secretory, blurred vision in the form of uh, uh, constriction of the eye, because or I'm sorry, dilation because you're blocking the constriction. Constriction is parasympathetic, dilation is sympathetic. Uh, you can cause tachycardia and increase blood pressure, okay? Because what we're doing is we're doing an anticholinergic function and slow GI activity, constipation or perhaps urinary retention. Just the same as, as we would see with any type of sympathetic agonist. When you're a parasympathetic antagonist, you're a sympathetic, you're mimicking a sympathetic agonist. Bringing in a little bit of trivia here for you tea and coffee lovers. Uh, theophylline, the drug theophylline is actually found in coffees and teas or chocolates. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a close cousin of the molecules that give chocolate and coffee and teas their flavors. They're called methyl xanthines. In fact, I had a, a colleague of mine who had asthma and she was resistant or allergic to some of the uh, bronchodilators and so as a kid they got her hooked on coffee because coffee has is is got lots of theophylines which will act as bronchodilators. Um, they're naturally occurring uh, alkaloids and they're the ones that give coffee and teas their sort of uh, unique bitter you know uh, savory flavors if you will um, that we all love if uh, you love these products. But again, what they have is, is they're, not as, they're not as potent as the beta 2s or the anticholinergics, but uh, they do work. Okay? Um, what they're doing is they're phosphodiesterase blockers. So they are, uh, they're, they're, they're keeping nitric oxide around longer in airways, um, leave, you know, fostering um, uh, smooth muscle relaxation. The biggest issue with theophylline is, and other sorts of methyl xanthine compounds is that uh, they do have lots of side effects. They have a very, very narrow margin uh, with therapeutic index. That is to say, there's not much dose change before you begin to get into issues of side effects that are um, sympathetic in nature. 
Okay, so you see agitation, tachypnea, flushing, uh, and so forth. So what you see this um, this uh, very very narrow window. So it's very very hard to deliver this in any kind of a other than a than a very low dose. Next, we're going to talk about the corticosteroids, how the corticosteroids do their thing, how they're administered, and side effects. Certainly, when it comes to pulmonary systems, uh, the most convenient or with least side effects, rapid acting, are the inhaled forms of corticosteroids, though uh, they, uh, steroids can be delivered in any number of ways, including uh, oral and or uh, injection. You may recall that corticosteroids are very, very lipophilic. That is to say, they, they travel through the blood in albumin proteins and then diffuse into cells, commonly binding intracellular or nuclear receptors, leading to altered genetic expression in the cells where there are uh, receptor targets. Um, and so what we see is this, this combination of genetic effects across different types of cells. Um, first and foremost, what we're seeing uh, when you give certain types of corticosteroids is a reduction in inflammatory signaling in these cells. It seems to be down-regulating the nonspecific inflammatory responses. So we see fewer cytokines, fewer uh, inflammatory mediators, which may translate into things like less edema, less mucus secretion, that sort of a thing, fewer cytokines, and so forth. There also seem to be a, an effect um, on reducing um, inflammatory uh, mediating cells. That is to say, fewer eosinophils. And that's a big, big thing in COPD. It seems like eosinophils are playing some sort of a role here. Uh, whether that has to do with these T helper cells that we talked about earlier, um, it's certainly down-regulating mast cells. So you have less histamine, less, uh, you know, it's it's stabilizing these uh, mast cells and macrophages. So you're not you're seeing fewer inflammatory signals and lower populations of the cells that might respond to those signals. Beyond corticosteroids, we see uh, other drugs aimed at different pathways that are known to mediate inflammation. Uh, one category of, of signaling molecules are known as leukotrienes, and these will upregulate or activate some of these granulocytes that I was just talking about in the previous slide. Um, the two ways that we go after leukotrienes, either we're going to block the synthesis of those things, sort of like... Um, NSAIDs and cyclooxygenase. Uh, what we do there is we're, we're blocking the creation of the pain signal. In this case, we're blocking the creation of uh, leukotriene. So no signal, no response. Or you can go downstream and work on the, um, on the receptors. So you can block the receptors so that even if you are making leukotrienes, they don't respond. They're very common. You might see these in ads. Um, uh, quite a few of these have very strong um, marketing campaigns that you might see in, uh, in media or online. So this is a nice figure. It shows you sort of how all these things are, are connected. Um, what you're doing is blocking the signals of inflammation. Um, so upstream, it turns out one of the effects of steroids is to prevent the creation of this precursor. So steroids can block this phospholipase in addition to some of the other effects that we saw. The NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that we've talked about previously, like aspirin, ibuprofen, um, and naproxen sodium, so forth, those are blocking the creation of prostaglandins, and then we talked about blood clotting thromboxanes. So we can block it down here, and this is the third piece of the puzzle. These are leukotriene antagonists that will block this enzyme. This, this is cyclooxygenase, this is lipoxygenase. In any case, it's blocking the creation of that signal, which would uh, mediate bronchoconstriction, inflammation, and, and secretion. So blocking that means you don't get this. Blocking this means you block bronchoconstriction as well as inflammation and pain. This one is a little bit more upstream, though it's not quite as, as um, even though it would seem like you might want to go after this in order to get all of these, um, it's not completely able to block all of it. So the, oftentimes you'll use these things in combination. 
A relatively new category of drugs that are that are quite promising are known as mast cell stabilizers, and your book talks about it. So I'd like you just to read a little bit with the idea that uh, as these things come along, they may become more and more prevalent. So mast cell stabilizers, what we see is that it seems to block the, um, the exocytosis uh, function of mast cells and mast cells are, are are they're kind of angry white blood cells they're ready to degranulate almost at the drop of a hat and so what we see is that there's some kind of inhibition with the mast cell stabilizers that prevents calcium coming in um, and prevents exocytosis but this is still very much a work in progress and it'll probably be uh, a few years before we see uh, real, real um, uh, market uh, available drugs for this. Part of what makes these mast cell stabilizers um, so attractive is that they seem to be relatively specific. They're working to prevent the release of histamine. And so you can give this to a patient relatively early in their progression of disease and avoid the remodeling and persistent inflammation. So uh, what they're looking at is for things like chronic bronchial asthma, particularly in young patients, um, uh, a, a, an interesting form of asthma that only appears um, after strenuous exercise, and then certainly the sort of allergic um, precursor to asthma, which includes rhinitis and other things. So people who are allergies have a higher risk of falling into asthma. So if you can dial down these mast cells very, very early in the process, you can uh, save a lot of trouble. So these are, again, very, very attractive drugs. A particularly form and potentially deadly form of asthma is known as status asthmaticus. It's very, very severe and often presents with, um, uh, with uh, tolerance to drugs. That means that they're unresponsive to usual therapy and they require much more severe and potentially um, uh, side effect prone therapies. Uh, what we see with status asthmaticus, the most common thing, and this is why I'm bringing this up, certainly uh, if you're in an allergen rich uh, environment and you have allergies, that could be a problem. Um, certainly ingestion or um, uh, vomit uh, aspiration can, can, can trigger these things. Uh, but the, the thing that, that you can make a real difference on is this one, this non-compliance in taking medications, including overuse. Because these bronchodilators are prone to tolerance, people continuing to use it again and again and again may actually trigger uh, worsening of symptoms um, uh, in their situation. So uh, what the point here would be to uh, help the patients take the medication exactly as it's prescribed in the method that uh, the inhaler or whatever uh, agent that they're taking should be delivered. Another form of asthma that's uh, particularly interesting is this exercise induced asthma. And it's not entirely clear um, uh, how, how this happens. And it can happen in even Olympic level um, athletes. Uh, I remember reading a story a few years ago about a, a, an Olympic caliber swimmer who would uh, get done with a race and would start wheezing and didn't even realize that she had asthma. And as soon as she was able to uh, have that diagnosed, as soon as somebody realized what it was, she uh, started receiving treatment and, and, and her, uh, and her uh, uh, performance improved dramatically. What we think going on is that you have a number of factors that are triggering hyper, um, a hyper constrictive response. Is it um, because of the, uh, the hyper, hyperventilation? Uh, a low CO2, may, it, there seemed to be some evidence of that. Uh, cooling, so sort of an irritation because you're ventilating so much, you're cooling off those surfaces uh, and that may be triggering some kind of an inflammation or irritation. Uh, drying is certainly a very likely possibility um, or uh, mechanical irritation because of that increased rate of ventilation. Um, one of the easy ways to manage exercise-induced asthma is to get both a good uh, warm-up, a, a slow, easy, gradual warm-up, along with a cool down. So, uh, and that's hard for people. They want to just get going and then they want to get done. We're in this sort of destination-oriented society where all that matters is whether you get it done or not. 
Um, and, and that's not necessarily productive. Um, it needs to be a holistic process, a slow, gradual warm up, uh, and then a, then a nice, um, well well defined cool down as part of the overall workout rather than as adjuncts. Another form of asthma that's also um, something that that uh, may be of a particular interest to to, to your uh, your discipline is known as occupational asthma. And what we're talking about here is is workplace uh, asthma, uh, due, primarily due to uh, the fact that the workplace will often contain allergens and inflammatory or in irritants at higher concentrations than perhaps in the home. Um, though it doesn't mean that you can't see a similar response for people who live in in certain conditions. So we call it occupational asthma due to the fact that it's it's very very common in the workplace, um, but uh, but it can appear in in uh, in any situation. Okay, so we're going to pause right here in uh, part two. When we come back in uh, segment three, which will be the final segment, we're going to talk about things like nose irritation. We call that rhinitis and coughing, and then some general aspects of chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. We've seen some specifics up to this point, and then we'll go back into some more nonspecific generalized disorders that are not necessarily attributed to any single cause. So we'll talk to you in a little bit.